They say if we'll only avoid, avoid any confrontation with the enemy, he'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. All who oppose, all, all who oppose. Hey guys, good morning. This is Matt from Cane Boys Gaming. So we're returning back to what what remains of Edith Finch. So we're going down into the basement where we were supposed to go yesterday. Alright. Let's see if she starts talking. Mom said the basement was off limits, unless I wanted another tetanus shot. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, the dad was trying to rebuild the uh, dragon. I saw you sneak down to the basement once, carrying packages. That's a water heater. I thought maybe she was hiding presents. It turned out she was hiding a lot more than that. I remember asking mom once about where Walter had gone. She said after Barbara died, he got as far away as he could. If there's a pattern in all these stories, I think it's that none of us has gotten very far. Build a river. I'm building my river track. Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. On that first day, after the shaking started, I didn't think I'd survive. After a few days, I settled into a routine. That's what kept me sane. Having a schedule, living for today. I always expected to be dead tomorrow. But if you wait long enough, you get used to anything. Oh, wow. Even a monster on the other side of the door starts to feel warm. Almost friendly. And then one day, everything just... stopped. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. Maybe it got tired. Maybe. Or maybe I just got tired of being afraid. It's been a week now, the longest in 30 years. I'm done waiting. I have to leave while well, I still can. out there somewhere. Whatever killed Barbara. 
Molly. And Calvin. Maybe this is all a mistake. But I need to stop living the same day, even if it kills me. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. I'm going to appreciate all of it, especially the food. I don't mind if I only have a year left, or a month a single week. I'd be happy. I can already imagine the sun in my face. Walter died when I was six. I can't believe my mom never told me he was down here. I'm sure my mom was trying to protect me. Maybe she was afraid I'd end up like Walter. But if she never told me about an uncle under the house, I can only imagine what else she was hiding. I don't want to make the same mistakes she made. I'm trying to bury something that's still alive. Now that there's only one of us left, I thought it was time I heard the stories for myself and found out what happened to everyone else. But now I'm worried the stories themselves might be the problem. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. I don't know if I should even be writing this. Maybe it'd be better if all this just died with me. But I thought you should know about your family. And the history you're a part of. Though, to be honest, I feel as lost as you probably do right now. I think the people in these stories believed them, for what that's worth. of imagination and stubbornness and madness. Any of it seems possible. I think we've been surrounded by death for so long we've just gotten used to it. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? It's embarrassing for me to admit this, but the pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Three of the gerbils are mine, and two had been my fault.
Sven built the house, but it was Edie who designed the cemetery. I'm sure Odin's monument had been Edie's idea. My mom was always trying to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. She could see it poking out of the water at low tide. Edie said she dreamed about the old house every night. Edie's side was always easier for me to understand. But the older I get, the more I can see where my mom was coming from. Her dad had been pretty strict, but it wasn't enough to save her brothers. She was just trying to do better. She lost two of her brothers, just like I did. I get why she tried so hard to protect us. There's so many things I wish I could ask my mom now. Part of me thinks this is what she wanted all along. For me to come back someday and find everything out for myself. But looking back on it now, if she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. I never met Grandpa Sam, but I think he and my mom had a lot in common. They were both pretty intense. Sam spent his life shooting photos, but Mom said he got nervous being in front of the camera. I guess we're all afraid of something. Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only you could see it. I think he saw things the rest of us don't. Thank <laughs> you. 
as he saw. Well, same too. I can't imagine my mom ever writing poetry yet. A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard, before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard. stood far apart, just blew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. I tried to talk him out of it, though he'd never met her. We don't need a stepmom for the words that I know.
time the photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. But Gus declined, and that was a sign he held up his middle finger. Wind picked up, and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. Rain came down in buckets then, but no one seemed to break. That made him have destroyed his hunger bag with crudely too. sounded much too close and full of angry power. But all my father said to this was, Make the music louder. I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, sea and foam. But I didn't. Until we found you. She never talked about it, but Mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. Okay. My mom moved up to the loft after her brother's died. At the time, it was as far away as she could get. She spent a summer building houses in Kolkata, where she met my dad, Sanjay. My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. Lewis was born a year later. When my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure he was happy to have her back. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. For a while, things were good, almost normal. But it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when he gave him Castle. Mom 
girl sat in the searching for the other. Then she sealed the doors. I don't know what I found in the house. Mom didn't want to get him out. Mom definitely blamed Edie, but I think Lewis blamed himself. After he graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room until Mom got him a job at the cannery. Lewis and I spent a lot of time playing games together, but he was surprisingly bad at them. He died a lot. Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the couple began in January shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. He kept working at the cannery, but he withdrew the part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to wander. I asked him to describe it. He said he started small. Imagining a labyrinth. He'd feel his way about. Then something new. Bats. And toads. Things that have not names. He knew it was all in his head. But he took it very seriously. And he had hopes he'd find himself. But he found something more. Lewis had become a model employee, methodical, tireless, focused, like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. Told me he made a new friend. On the edge of a city he named Lewis Topia. And built the city out slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians.
and songs for them to play. We talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. All day his imagination grew strong. He no longer spoke at the piano. But his dropping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him. That all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination. So he could do whatever he wished. He held an election for the mayor. And he won. They begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game. Would the conqueror city then immediately push on? You lose. Saint Louis. He started drifting away from our reality. Many happens until one day he forgot to go home from the gallery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, Arthur Lewis kept saying more. From Lewisburg, he heard rumors of her. Handsome Queen. led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. He was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him. But the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon, but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him.
began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. Even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder. The palace would be packed with his companions. who knew him. Dang. Capitated this, sir. My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him. All right, guys. Well, we found out what happened to Lewis. Until next time, this is Matt saying peace. So far, we've gotten everybody except for Dawn, Sam, and Edie. So next time, we'll get that going. You guys have a great evening, great day to your day. Stay dry. And we'll see you next time. Peace. And go home.